first of all, thanks a lot for uh, having me here. Um, my name is Lucas. Um, right now I'm in the car group at Princeton University. Uh, I actually did my undergrad here in Mainz, so I spent a bunch of my time over at the chemistry building and some time here two floors down. So it's nice to come back. Um, I want to talk about the work we've done recently about um, new Dirac fermions, especially in 2D, and especially how this relates to properties of some materials. And before I run out of time, I want to do the acknowledgments. Um, so, so, of course, my boss, Roberto Carr, then um, Aris Alexander Dunatra, who you all know most probably, who's done a great deal, ha has helped us a lot with this paper. Then, of course, Titus Neupert from the PCTS, who is now an assistant professor in Zurich. And yeah, it was a lot of fun working with these people. And this is the result. So basically, when we think about topological materials or topological insulators, so on, these are basically non-interacting symmetry-protected um, topological phases, right? So one of the most simple ways to think about TIs, right, is to take a semiconductor. You have a band inversion of some sort then you use spin orbit coupling or some other mechanism to cut the bands open, and then you can compare an insulator to an insulator, right? The electron fillings are exactly the same, but this one is topological non-trivial, and this one is topological trivial. These things are called symmetry protected, because for example, in a topological insulator, you at least, at, least, at least need a Kramers degeneracy, so time reversal. You can also have topological crystalline insulators where space group symmetries take over this protection of these states, but basically, um, what you do, you compare insulators to insulators and so on. And really recently, let's say in the last one and a half to two years, um, we, we have found, we have not found, we have rediscovered a new type of symmetry, and these are these non-somorphic symmetries. So I'm sure Andre will talk about this a little bit more uh, later on. I'll just want to briefly introduce this. But basically what the difference between, you know, all known topological insulators or even crystalline insulators are basically materials that have somorphic symmetries. I'll explain in a second what that means. But, um, and basically there we have these canonical rules, right? If you completely feel a, fill a band, then you end up with an insulator, for example. With these non-somorphic symmetries, this is a little bit different. So these normal filling rules fail for ourselves because basically what happens, we have these sticky points in the band structure here where there's a degeneracy that is protected by this non-somorphic symmetry. And so basically what you get in these systems is gaplessness guaranteed by these non-somorphic symmetries at certain electron fillings. And so basically here you have a half-filled band and it's gapless, right? So if we, t call, uh, if we count in spin degeneracy, you have two electrons and you have a gapless material. And so, as I said before, there are really two types of symmetries we, we have been looking at. Now, one is just a somorphic symmetry. Um, in layman's terms, you can say in the somorphic symmetry is a symmetry that preserves the origin. So if I put my origin at this green cross here, I have inversion symmetry. And so inversion symmetry maps the green cross to the green cross itself, right? Or it maps this blue dot to this blue dot. Non-somorphic symmetry, however, unavoidable translate the origin, right? So this is indicated here by this line. This is a, a screw axis. So what you do is, for example, you take this guy, you rotate over here, and then you translate by half a unit cell. And so if you have the symmetry act on the origin, you also translate the origin because of this translation. And so the symmetry here I'm showing you is basically the, um, the projected crystal structure of a 2D layer of the MX2 class. So we're going to consider monolayers of zirconium iodide, molybdenum telluride, and tungsten telluride. And so in the first talk of the uh, part of the talk, I want to explain to you what we have done to characterize these layers topologically. And then I want to explain what the implications of this are in terms of properties. Um, again, remember we have, um, we have inversion symmetry in the monolayer, which helps a lot. But we also have these non-somorphic symmetries, which turn out to be really, really important. And so what you can do now with these non-somorphic symmetries is really cool. So basically, you can write down three different kinds of band structures. And so we have, we have indicated those by different Fermi levels. So if you look at the uh, semi-metal E1, where the Fermi level lies directly um, at these like, degeneracy points due to the non-symorphic symmetry, you basically have a filling-enforced semi-metal, right? You have to be exactly at the right filling to be at the Dirac point. You can easily write down a band insulator, right? If the, the filling is in, in a gap between these two, two lobes here, basically, you just end up with a regular band insulator. But there's something else, which is this new class of topological metal, which we have found. And that's basically 
a, a semi-metal due to bent inversion, which is protected by this non-somorphic symmetries. So in contrast to, to the semi-metal here, where you have to be in between the, the Fermi level, basically, the Fermi level has to lie in between these two bands here, you can see, basically, we can deform, we can think of this, this part of the band structure as the upper part of, of a band structure like this. And so what happens is that the connectivity at the gamma point changes to so invert this band goes down and this band goes up. But these band structures are topologically different because these degeneracies cannot be, be broken unless you break the crystalline symmetry, right? So if you follow this, this band, this is topologically trivial from two times this. You can generalize this to spin orbit coupling. So this is without spin orbit coupling. If you have spin orbit coupling, basically in this first case, you get this hourglass. And then later on, if you take this guy and introduce spin orbit coupling, you basically get two overlapping um, hourglasses. And so what we want to do now is I want to convince you that there are actually some are real material examples of these band structures, and they have really profound implications. And so since I'm by training, I'm a chemist, um, I want to introduce this by, you know, some real band structure calculations. So this is um, band structure calculations of monolayers of zirconium diiodide, molybdenum ditellaride, and tungsten ditellaride. This is without spin or recoupling. And basically what you can see here in this zirconium iodide, if you follow the unoccupied bands, they basically return to themselves, right? If you go to molybdenum ditellaride or tungsten ditellaride, if you follow this band, you have to cross the Fermi level once and go up. So basically, this is the case of this bent inverted topological semi-metal. And as I said, it's protected because you cannot just smoothly define this bent structure into this bent structure without breaking the symmetry here. So as long as the symmetry is preserved, this is topologically distinct from this. But the nice thing here actually is because the monolayers have such a low symmetry, the Dirac crossings we have here can basically appear in any line where this um, screw symmetry is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. And so there are certain lines in the brilliant zone and in our case, it just appears along the line gamma x, and it can literally be anywhere. It cannot just be removed by any perturbation that respects the screw symmetry. Um, the reason, again, as I said, the reason why we have this Dirac cone is the bent inversion of orthogonal screw representations. Um, the nice thing here as well is that if you look at the Dirac crossing, you see that they're highly anisotropic, and actually basically following Andrew Bernovic's proposal of a 3D wild fermion, we, we dubbed this a 2D Dirac, Dirac fermion, because if you look closely at these cones, these cones are so anisotropic, basically, that the, that the whole cone tilts over and produces electron and hole pockets at the same time. And so what it is, if you look at the Dirac point, if your chemical potential is directly at the Dirac point, you have this hole-like surface and electron-like uh, surface. If you decrease the Fermi level, the hole-like Fermi surface will take over. And if you increase the electron, the, the Fermi energy, the extra elect electron light um, Fermi surface will take over. It's, of course, extremely obvious that this has profound implications on transport and magnetic resistance and whatnot. And um, here I just showed you the most basic Hamiltonian that can describe this. So we in a 2D case, so we only have two, two, uh, two Pauli matrices to play with in general to describe a normal Dirac Hamiltonian. So this is just the normal Dirac. But you have this term that is proportional to the identity matrix that tilts over this cone. And basically, when this ux is equal to vx and vy, then this cone will tilt over and you get a type 2. It's, it's also important to mention that only if you really enclose this Dirac point with a Fermi surface, you get a, a berry phase of pi. So if you do a berry phase calculation for this whole like surface here, since it doesn't enclose the Dirac point, it's trivial. That is one of the most profound differences between um, these type 2 and type 1 Dirac fermions. Okay. So this was like a rough overview of what we, a quick overview of what we're going to do. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we came up to classify these new fermions topologically. Um, so the canonical way of um, classifying um, semi-metals or direct semi-metals is the following. You basically locate the crossing point and then you do an integral around it. You just, you know, integrate over the Berry curvature and whatnot and you get pi. And that's basically the um, topological protection, how you can do that. Now, of course, this works here too, right? You just find this point, you integrate around it. So this is, as long as you find a loop that is screw symmetrically, that is, you know, it is ma it's mapped from here to here by inverting the, uh, not inverting the chirality, you always get a pi if you follow around this. But actually, we, we found another way of characterizing these cones, which is, I think, much more interesting, and this is by non-abelian Wilson loops. 
Um, so I know that in the audience there are not many people who are really familiar with these things, so I tried to explain it a little bit um, in most simple terms. I'm for sure also not the world's biggest expert on these things. What you basically do is, um, these non-abelian Wilson loops are gener generalizations of abelian Wilson loops. So abelian Wilson loops are basically Berry phases um, with one band, and since we have multiple bands here, you just generalize this to multiple bands. And so what you do, instead of having your Berry's phase with only one index, or orbital index, you basically get a, a matrix A A I J, which is the, usually the usual formula for this. And so now what you can do is, since it's a matrix, right, a matrix has a determinant. The determinant is usually then associated with a Berry's phase, that is, if you go around this circle. But of course, since this is a matrix, it also has eigenvalues. And what we can show now is that we can characterize the topological class of these monolayers by just doing a Wilson loop from y to gamma to y. So the Dirac cone appears between gamma and x, somewhere here, for example. And of course, because of time reversal, it has to appear there. And so what we claim is that if you do a Wilson loop, you just take your, your, your wave functions, you basically do the inner product of all the, the, project, the product of all projectors along this way, you get the Wilson loop. And this already tells you if you have a band inversion somewhere there. And so how this works is basically, in general, the eigenvalues of a Wilson loop just come in complex conjugate pairs. Um, lambda 1, lambda star, basically. But once we have a band inversion, we actually see that the eigenvalues of the Wilson loop will be quantized to values of you know, 0 and 1. And to show you how this works in practice, you know, these were just a lot of formulas, how do we do this in reality? So we can build a tight binding model of W2E2. These are the basis functions, so um, it makes sense chemically, right? You have, um, you have two sublettes, the A and B sublettes. We have some dx squared minus dy squared type orbitals here, and we have some pz orbitals, uh, yeah, PZ, no, yeah, pz orbitals no, px, I'm sorry, px orbitals at the tellurium sites, and basically then you take it times two because you have two sublattices. And so this is the tight binding model we have of our non-trivial phase, and you see if you do the Wilson loop spectrum, that is the eigenvalues of the Wilson loop going from gamma to x, you see that at first it is quantized to zero and pi, but once we, we cross this crossing here, they just become complex conjugate again. And so this is a fingerprint and a topological characterization of this Dirac semi-metal. It's interesting because so far the Wilson loops, of course, have been known to be able to characterize topological phases, but it's the first time that people have really characterized topological metals with it. And so here we have a trivial band structure. For example, this is a toy model of zirconium diiodide. And here you say the Wilson loop spectrum just consists of two con uh, complex conjugate eigenvalues and nothing interesting happens. And so this is really a new way of looking at these materials and is, of course, generalizable to three dimensions and so on. That is a nice thing. Okay, so this was just a brief overview over the, the topological um, stuff we have done. Um, I am, since I'm a chemist, I'm also always interested in these um, the properties. And since I've been lucky enough to be in Princeton at the time where Mars discovered WT2, uh, we all got a little bit of a head start to work on these materials. And um, to just give you a brief overview, because Mars didn't really talk that much about it, um, there's really been this you know, new trend that we've been looking at magnetotransport of materials. And I, <laughs> I wrote ludicrous because that was the first um, <laughs> proposal for the paper, but it really is, right? So if you look at these materials, um, WT2, bismuth, cadmium arsenide, tantalum arsenide, and so on, they all have magneto resistance, which is basically a few million percent at low enough temperatures and so on, which is insane if you think about it, right? So you usually plot it in a log, log plot where you don't really appreciate this, but, you know, the resistance changes by... 10 million percent, which is insane, right? And so there's the question, is this a general phenomenon or is this just, you know, does it happen to be uh, for one or two materials and they have really, you know, it's coincidental or not? And I think maybe, you know, when we first found WT2 or it came out in the market, basically people said, hmm, yeah, I mean, we knew bismuth before, but there's really nothing known. But I think it, then it became obvious that there are a lot of materials that show these really, really insane MRs, and also the mobilities are extremely high for just bulk crystals that have been grown in an oven. You don't have to, don't forget that, right? You get conductivities in the nano-ohm centimeters, which is insane. Usually highly pure metals have this. And so, um, basically, if you look at all these band structures, at first, they don't really have too much in common, right? Um, so if you have cadmium arsenide and tantalum arsenide, you have the Weyl or Dirac stage, which are just linear dispersing. And at first, I think people have said, okay, this is just because it's some property of the Dirac fermions. Then you have niobium phosphate, which has Weyl, but it also has these electron and hole pockets. 
bismuth and WT only have electron and hole pockets. So how does this all fit together, right? How can we somehow make sense of this? Um, that's one feature of WT2 that I wanted to go into a little bit. An another feature is that shortly after this paper has been published, um, people did um, ARPES measurements of the Fermi surface of W2 in bulk, and they found this circular dichroism. You know, you see this, there are two pockets here, electron and hole pockets, as indicated here, and by time reversal you have to have two, but they, basically what you do in, an, in, an, um, in a, a dichroism experiment in ARPES, you take light with a certain helical polarization, right, right-handed or left-handed, and then you uh, basically measure the difference of intensities between this right-handedness and this left-handedness. What you see really nicely here is that the different brilliant zones, or the different parts of the brilliant zones have opposite um, weight. And so this is really peculiar, and um, what I'm trying to present to you now is to give you a little bit of an explanation where this could come from. And so, um, to understand why these materials all have this really high magnetic resistance, um, I just quickly want to review what the, the current theory is. It has to be said that Everything that we're discussing now has basically been done on a semi-classical level. Um, it basically completely ignores the effects of any Berry curvature or whatever, uh, whatever present, and so it's not quite clear to me yet if this is all completely correct, and I think it leads a little bit more of um, you know, real theory to do that. Um, but at least these, this really semi-classical model at least qualitatively really fits these, these, uh, these uh, materials and explains nicely what it is doing. And so um, basically what people have identified as the key ingredient for this high MR theory is that you have this electron and hole pockets in tungsten and tetrahyde. This is ARPES measurements that shows this nicely. And basically what happens, you have to do a two-band model, two-fluid model of the semi-classical Boltzmann. And what you find that if the density of these electron and holes approaches one, the magnetic resistance basically scales as the square of the magnetic field times the mobilities. And so, um, at least in this very simple model, you can explain the reason why this magnetic resistance basically goes on forever in high fields is because the electron and hole density is almost one, and the reason why it's so extremely high is because the mobilities are extremely high. So if we can kind of explain why these things happen in this material, that would be a first starting point you know, as to why we have these unique properties, and if we understand this material, we have much higher hope to understand what's going on in these other materials. Because apparently, by just looking at the band structure, and looking for fingerprints in the dispersion or something, that is not enough. Okay. And so one of the first things we did is, um, when we did DFT calculations on this, we started by looking at the structure. And so the peculiar thing about this transition metal dichocognites is they crystallize in layered structures. And so it's kind of natural to assume a hierarchy of states, right? So if you understand a monolayer, you can basically take the crystal as stacks of these monolayers because they most probably are weakly interacting and then see if you can understand what's going on. And so if you start with the monolayer, as I've shown you before, we have this um, type 2 Dirac fermion here, which is protected by this non-somorphic symmetry. And so what happens if we couple it to a bilayer? If you couple to a bilayer, you see suddenly these electron and hole pockets emerge. If you go to the bulk, you still have these electron and hole pockets. There's another band that crosses, but if you turn on spin orbit coupling, that gets gapped out, and you're left with these electron hole pockets. And so when I saw this first, this is like almost over a year ago, I said, oh, this is really interesting. I think we can explain why this happens. And so it basically goes in the following. Imagine we have a monolayer with a screw symmetry, right? Um, normally, we have an untilted Dirac cone, and we want to compare it to a Dirac cone, cone that's tilted. It doesn't even need to be type 2. Is there a spin orbit coupling? There is spin orbit coupling, so spin orbit coupling will slightly gap the cones. So um, there's Liang Fu has, um, basically Liang Fu has already shown that if you take a monolayer of WT2 and introduce spin orbit coupling, it becomes a topological insulator. That basically also follows from this Wilson loop characterization. But um, the splitting is actually not so big, and you already have these electron hole pockets once you introduce spin orbit coupling. And, um, what you can see here is that these gaps here don't really change that much once you go from the bulk, you know, without spin orbit coupling to spin orbit coupling. So I think the energy scale that you really need to look at is the coupling between these layers and how this influences, um, you know, the chemistry and the physics. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to compare this untilted Dirac cone with a tilted Dirac cone. And so if we have the monolayer with true symmetry, this is going to look like this. So now we can imagine we have two layers that are placed from each other in infinity, right? So they will not couple to each other, so these cones will just be doubly degenerate. 
What we can do then, we can put the layers really close to each other so that they interact. They basically form bonding and anti-bonding states of these cones. And um, if we stack them in the way that we preserve the screw symmetry, that is that the, the symmetry that preserves this coupling, basically these will be gapless. But you already see there's a profound difference between an untilted cone and a tilted cone. If we have an untilted cone, the Fermi level lies directly at these two new Dirac points. If we have a tilted cone, we form this sort of electron holds pockets naturally. And so then, if we would basically think of sliding these cones, uh, sliding these layers next to each other so that we destroy this glide plane symmetry we have in the monolayer, we naturally open a gap and electron and hole pockets emerge. And so this is some kind of like toy picture or cartoon picture, how I think this is happening, but I think this is really profound and gives you an idea of what is going on. It also tells you, this is why I'm, I've been neglecting spin orbit coupling, we, we open up gaps anyway, and spin orbit coupling I think can be seen as a perturbative effect, so it doesn't really change this picture at all. And it's also nice because then we know since these electron and hole pockets really come from these Dirac states in the monolayer that we can infer a lot of properties of this material back to the physics of the monolayer. And so this is why it's really nice that we know everything about the monolayer physics and topology so that we can move on. Okay. So here's a ab initio band structure calculation of basically this, this simple plot. We take, these, we take a monolayer we stack it in a way that the screw symmetry is preserved, and you kind of see that these gaps here are, uh, are closed, right? So these are the former Dirac cones. And then we destroy the screw symmetry, and suddenly these gaps go open. So this little cartoon, actually, you can reproduce it with Abinishio methods. OK, and so in the beginning, Haiwa said we should speculate a little bit. And so this is now one way of how I see these properties can emerge. Of course, unfortunately, we don't have enough experimental data actually to back it up. But here's basically how I would input this from a theory perspective, and I hope we can talk about this a little bit later because I have some ideas how we could actually show if these things are true or not. So I've shown you that in a monolayer, we have these Dirac cones, right? And so you all know from graphene, whenever you have a Dirac cone, there's some pseudo-spin degree of freedom. In graphene, it, it looks very nicely, right? It's just like a spin that rotates around the cone. And the always the idea is that if you have a pseudo-spin, the spins are orthogonal, so if the spin, spin is pointing in this direction and spin is pointing in that direction, the inner product, the scalar product of these two states has to be zero just because you know, they're orthogonal. And so in, here's the winding of the pseudo-spin in a monolayer without spin and coupling. You see it's not as nicely as it is in a Dirac Hamiltonian because we do have a lower symmetry so it can wind around. The only thing, because it's a topological property, it's only the winding that matters and it just winds one. So that's what is happening. But the presence of the pseudospin, of course, then immediately implies that there can be some protection from backscattering, just because, in similar in analogy to graphene, of course, right? And so when we then go to the, the bilayer, we can ask the question, how much of it does it actually survive, right? The pseudospin is, is um, theoretically, it's only really well defined if you have a gapless state, if there's no, no mass term in the Dirac Hamiltonian. But as I, as I showed you, Really, if we do the bilayer, this is the, the picture of the band structure, these gaps are rather small because they result from symmetry breaking and not other hybridization terms. So these, the, 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 the gaps here compared to the bandwidth of, these, of this Dirac set is rather small. So we would expect that at least um, approximately, you know, the pseudospin is still a well-defined degree of freedom. And so here I've calculated the Berry curvature in the Brillouin zone, which basically shows you that um, the topological properties of these bilayer system is still almost intact. So you would assume that you would, you sh if, you, if you integrate over half of the Brillouin zone, because we have two of these Dirac cones, you should get something like um, two in units of pi, but we get something like 1.95. So basically, the topological properties are almost intact in the bilayer system, which also tells us that we can directly infer any transport or other properties, so optical properties of these whole electron hole pockets from the physics of the monolayer. And so basically what I'm showing here is a, a radial plot of the scattering probability. So what you, is, what you do is you choose one point of the Fermi surface, which you fix, which is k, and then you vary k prime by going around the Fermi surface. So this is for one of the pockets. This is for the monolayer, and this is for the bilayer. As I said, since we have this really finite Berry curvature that almost adds up to the result that we expect, we expect a strong protection from backscattering for potentials U that do not destroy the, the pseudospin texture, right? And so if we focus on this first picture here, what we see is this, 
this bright blue line is basically for a potential that doesn't disturb the pseudo-spin uh, structure. So I just put an identity matrix here. Oh, sorry, th this dark blue. This is the dark blue. And what you can see is that backscattering or scattering, if if the if k prime is 180 degrees to the k you are, it's greatly suppressed. There's zero probability to be scattered back. Um, then, if we destroy the pseudo-spin texture by coupling these the pseudo-spin degrees of freedom strongly with each other, we actually enforce backscattering. And so if we, we have to look at the, at the impurities which cause this scattering to really distinguish what is happening. And so for the monolayer, this is really almost expected. This is Dirac physics, which you know from graphene. But now what I'm showing you here is basically the same plot for the bilayer. And you can see that the, the scattering for uh, potentials that do not disturb the pseudospin, it's not zero, but it's greatly suppressed, right? It, it doesn't want to scatter back. And backscattering usually is the largest contribution to resistance. And so if you have no backscattering, this implies you have very large mobilities. And so I think that is one way of looking at these materials that you say there's this intrinsic protection from backscattering, which comes from the Dirac physics of the monolayer. Um, but of course, uh, what we need to prove here, this is just a toy type binding model. This, this is taken from the type binding model we have made for WT2, but of course we really don't know the impurity potentials, right? And so um, I'm very happy that um, a few days ago there was a paper on the archive um, that showed that people have now really um, succeeded in making mono or bilayers and even quintuple layers of WT2 and MOT2. And people have tried to do this before by wet chemical methods but it's always very hard to do so because they're so air sensitive. And so what they do in CVD, they basically do it in vacuum, and so they are rather stable and they can actually do transport measurements on these. And what I found really, really interesting, what made me really happy is that they could not only really characterize these layers almost perfectly, and it fits almost perfectly with what you expect, they could also find the bilayers of W2 actually come in two different stackings, which is also really interesting because then you can probe the effect of this symmetry breaking. And here I show you the, uh, it's from the paper, basically the resistance as a function of temperature and they can measure the bilayer and the quintuple layer and then can even do the MR of the bilayer. And already at the level of a bilayer, you see the magnetic resistance and as expected, the monolayer because it's a quantum spin hall insulator because of the spin orbit coupling, right? It's an insulator. And so for me, this is really encouraging because it shows you that basically what we predicted, these um, electron hole pockets emerge at the level of a bilayer. And since we you know, correlate these with the MR, you already see this in the bilayer. So I'm con currently in contact and email with these people and we hope to establish a collaboration on these things. Uh, Fon Ong in Princeton, I think, is also interested in measuring some stuff, um, which is really cool. And so that made me very happy. And also I've talked to um, people in the Yazdani group. Um, they have done experiments, uh, STM experience, um, experiments on W2 do right at the beginning and they see this kind of crazy TIE fighter like defects on WT2. And so this was taken early on. So here's a here's a plot from a recent paper from, from Mars and other people that basically correlates the magneto resistance in WT2 with a triple R ratio, which is just in some way a hand waving way. It's a measure of it's a measure for the um, quality of the crystal. And you can say the triple R ratio goes extremely high and as the triple R ratio goes up, the mobility and the MR, you know, goes up. And so what that tells me is that there are defects in WT2 and they do scatter. But the question is how much do they scatter and how important are they, right? So this was most probably taken somewhere here. So these are rather defective materials, but still there are quite a lot of it. I think it's, it's not fair to say that this material is completely defect free, especially it's been grown in flux and so on. And so um, what we are doing now, which is ongoing uh, research, I think I don't have time to talk to this about this in detail, but I'd be happy to do this later on. We did some calculations, some DFT calculations about like defect formation energies on these materials. And basically what we find is that the defects that are most prominent, at least in the monolayer and the bilayer, are defects that don't affect the physics at the Fermi level. So the, the states of these defects, they're hybridized with the conduction and valence band, but the, the Dirac states or the electron hole pockets are basically unaffected by this. So which really also tells me that even though there are defects in the system, they don't really, you know, affect the transport properties too much. Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk to you is the circular dichroism, um, which I didn't really know about before, but I, um, there was Tim Birkelbach at the um, PCTS 
in, in Princeton. He worked a lot on this like monolayers of molybdenum disulfide where you have extremely interesting um, optical spectroscopy with excitons and so on. And their circular dichroism is used as a versatile probe to really, to really touch on the, the phases of the electronic structure, right? So you maybe know that if you have, even if you have a gap Dirac cone, you still have a little bit of Berry curvature left, right? And so if you just have a simple two-band model, the circular dichroism spectra, which really is the intensity of right-handed polarized light minus the intensity of left-handed polarized light, is proportional to this Berry curvature. And so then I had the idea if we, do, if we can explain the circular dichroism in WT2 by, looking, by basically tracing it back to the Berry curvature, that would also be an indirect proof that our idea is correct, at least with the physics. And so this has been used extensively in graphene, for example. So here you see the the Dirac cone of graphene with left-hand polarized light. Here you see it with right-hand polarized light. And so then if you take the difference, you see that you can basically resolve you know, the different chiralities with that. And then if you do a Fermi surface plot, you kind of see this like moon-like shaped. So basically the, the chirality of this Berry curvature that is coming from the Dirac physics plays an important role. And so of course, um, these this uh, experiment on monolayers, molybdenum, and sulfate have been optical absorption experiments. Five minutes? Yeah, I'll be done soon. Um, they, have been done, um, they have been done with optical absorption um, experiments. And so what we are doing now is really um, RPAS. So basically what happens is that you shoot light on a surface, right? An electron gets kicked out and then goes into the continuum. But it's actually, it's not quite true that the final state in an RPAS experiment is really a continuum state. Because you can show that if you only have a plane wave, all this circular dichroism has to be zero because it's a totally symmetric combination. So it's actually, we found out that it's not so easy to model um, circular dichroism experiments with just a simple um, DFT approximation because there are some people like Hubert Ebert in Munich who can do this one-step calculations, but they're extremely complicated. And we wanted something that, you know, is controllable and confirms our hypothesis. So basically what we did is the following. We assumed that we take an electron out of the you know, Fermi surface and shoot it up to a highly occupied Bloch state. But it's still a Bloch state in the sense that it feels the crystal potential, right? It can be plane wave-like, but it's not an exact plane wave. And so what you have to do is you can take a few plane waves and approximate the, the final electron state, but then you have the then you have to somehow play with the symmetry of this. You know, you can do a totally symmetric combination and not so on. And so what we did is the really the most simple one. We wanted a final state that is as simple as possible. So we took a plane wave with four g vectors, the most simple g vectors in the totally symmetric combination. So basically, our final state is the most boring state that we can have that could show potentially show circular dichroism. That is because we're interested in the physics that comes from the, you know, from the uh, occupied state, not the unoccupied state. And then basically what you can calculate is oops, what you can calculate is the, the transition momentum matrix elements for an arbitrary polarization of light, so lambda plus minus. And then basically the intensity of the photo of the dichroism is just proportional to the different of P plus minus P minus. That's a rough measure. And so what I what I plot here is basically our calculation. And you can see that um, basically we see an opposite signal as, as expected. So the um, the, uh, the electron pocket here, no, the whole pocket here, uh, has a different signal than um, this, the second electron pocket. We have some states at the gamma point. This is just because we put the Fermi level at this point. Um, they're not really that important. But um, basically, it already confirms our um, first intuition that the, the dichroism signal is somewhat proportional to this chirality of the cones. Um, the reason why these two things have a different sign is the following. If you put our Fermi level here, you can see here it's the, the top part of the cone that is occupied, and here it's the bottom part of the cone. And since they have to have opposite chirality, you see that this guy and this guy have opposite chirality. If we, if we looked at the signal from this guy, it would have the same chirality as this. And so that already also gives us strong implications. I think that the circular dichroism is really coming from this non-trivial nature of these states, which ultimately can be traced back to the monolayer. Um, of course, our picture doesn't really exactly fit the experimental data. That's partially because it's, it's, this is for the bilayer. They did it for the bulk with spin-orbit coupling experimentally. And furthermore, the final state effect can be really real and have to be tr um, treated exactly. And so what I really hope is that somebody will actually do a real experimental study on the dichroism of this because 
what you need to do, you need to vary the photon energy to, to really trace the, the final state effects. And so in graphene, it works in a narrow range of photon energies, but then it also goes away. And there are other um, materials, for example, copper. So I'm really hoping somebody will do this because I think it's really a versatile tool to probe you know, the Dirac-ness of these electron and hole pockets. And basically, here's the band structure plot. You can also see that it varies greatly with you know, the chemical potential, but what is nice is that the main the, the, the strength of the dichroic system uh, signal is really the highest if we are at this Dirac pocket. So that also tells me, you know, it's not just something because of low symmetry or something, it's really because of this Dirac physics at play. Okay, and so to summarize, um, I hope I've convinced you that we have introduced really a new type of topological semi-metal that comes from band inversions, and it's at a filling where you would normally not expect to have a metal for this non-somorphic setting, so usually these if you had the filling that we have, you would expect a semiconductor or an insulator, but we have a metal because we have a bent inversion. We have also found a new way of classifying this topological metal by using non-abelian Wilson loops. And we really have some almost real material examples in molybdenum detellerite and tungsten detellerite. And I hope I have convinced you a little bit at least that you know, this directness or this topological non-trivialness of the monolayer has profound implications for the bilayer and bulk structure. And yeah, so I just briefly want to talk about what I would envision for these things. As I said, I would li really like to have somebody who does photo emission systematically on this, but I would also like to see STM studies, especially quasi-particle interference, because this is the you know, proof of principle if this basic sectoring protection is actually real. You would expect to see something really non-trivial going to the bilayer and the bulk, you know, if you would do this. Of course, you could have scattering be between different um, pockets, but you could also, I think, resolve this by doing up initial calculations and see what this comes from. Unfortunately, um, the Yazdani group is not able to do quasi-particle interference on WT2. They have tried, they have not succeeded. And because these mono or bilayers are so extremely air sensitive, it's also hard to do that. But I think that would be really interesting because it would kind of give you um, an argument as to why these high MR materials are actually this high in MR. And also by, by being able to look at the defects um, you could make a lot of statements about if it's really just because the samples are so defect-free or if there's something non-trivial going on. Okay. And so with that, I stop and thank you for your attention.